We are taking a few weeks and talking about the call of God to service. One of those men that God selected out to use of God was Moses. Moses, someone, Brother Don gave me a little joke today. He said, look, uh, don't get worried about your life. Remember that, Joseph, that Moses started out as a basket case. And so uh, I, he gave me a lot of encouragement there. The truth of the matter is, it's a supernatural story of Moses. And Moses was called to do something at very difficult times. And different, I don't care if you're a man or a woman, if you're old or young, I don't care if you're a senior citizen or you, you are, are a brand new teenager. God has a purpose on this planet for you. He loves you. There's something he wants you to do. There's something you can do and you're supposed to do for him. And God is calling. We need to answer the phone. <laughs> He's got a purpose for us. There's something the Lord wants us to do in the ministry for the Lord. Not everybody will be in full-time Christian ministry, but all of us ought to struggle. Lord, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do with my time, my effort, my talents? What do you want me to do with my training and my trials or my family? How is it you want to use me in this life? Now, sometimes we may have grand, uh, you know, thoughts of grandeur, of, uh, of, of lots of fame or, or ad admiration, but oftentimes it's going to be in the tedious responsibilities of just doing what God wants me to do today. And if we'll do what, if we'll be what God wants us to be, we'll do what he wants us to do. I think Moses is the great story of this. We shared last week a little bit about the precarious, the precarious days in which he was living. It was not an easy day to be an Israelite. They had been, uh, there has been a new king in, in Egypt, and he did not know Joseph. Joseph was the instrument that God used to bring Jacob and 70 others of his descendants to Egypt and to live in Goshen. And, uh, but now he's dead, and the Pharaoh who knew him is dead, and now they're saying, man, these guys are multiplying, these Israelites are multiplying, we've got to do something about it. They increased their burden, and the more they burdened them, the more they grew and multiplied. Then the Pharaoh said, you know what, we'll do this. We'll make sure that uh, we cut off the young men. We see Pharaoh's uh, his, his decision to get rid of young men. That's still a process of Satan today. He is trying to destroy young men. There's a special target on the back of a teenage boy, a child, teenage, a, a, a young man. And especially, God's called men to lead. Men have always been God's method. And he's used that. And of course, we just came off a ladies conference and God uses ladies. But I'll just tell you, the devil is whacking at young men to get them angry, to get them addicted, to get them abusive, to get them disconnected and outside of reality, to get them lazy and irresponsible. Uh, there's all kinds of challenges going on, and we see Pharaoh, was his destruction was against young men. First, he tried to do it with the midwives, and then, of course, uh, went ahead and started taking them out of, the, out of their arms of their mothers and throwing them into the Nile River to be consumed by whatever's in there and to be drowned. And he did it by the hundreds and thousands of them. God began to work knowing what would need to be happening, not at that time. But uh, 80 years later, it wasn't going to get easier. It was going to get worse. But a man named Amrad and his wife, Jochebed, they had a little baby. It was her third child. They had an older sister, Miriam, an older daughter, Miriam, and he had a young, an, another, another son, Aaron, and, and then we have Moses. I'm assuming Moses is the youngest of the three. Maybe Aaron could have been. I don't know for sure. But, the, but we find that he has Miriam, and she's old enough to, to run around. And whenever, um, whenever Moses is born, Mama realized something. Dad looked at him and said, this kid's a goodly child. There's something special about him. And they hid him three months, as long as they could keep him. I'm sure there was a gag order, in fact. Every time he'd cry, oh, come on, son, no. No, we can't get it. I've seen. And she probably saw other mothers get their babies yanked out of their arms. And the police came and taken them away. And she said, I can't let them. Can't let you cry. But three months is about all it was. And when it was time for three months was come, and she said, I'm going to have to leave it to the providence and the protection of God. And she made a little ark, and she sent it out 
on the, the, the banks of the Nile River to come alongside hoping that Pharaoh's daughter would have mercy upon him. She sent Miriam, the older sister, to go and just kind of watch the little thing. And sure enough, they see the, they see the little basket pitched with tar and has a little, it's a little bassinet floating down the Nile. And mama, mama's praying at home, no doubt, concerned, begging God, have mercy. And uh, certainly the, the Pharaoh's daughter sees it, pulls it off. They see that the baby starts crying when she opens. Her heart, rather than becoming uh, angry, becomes compassionate. So this is not an Egyptian kid. This is a Hebrew kid. And then Miriam speaks up and said, you want me to get someone to nurse it for you? She said, yeah, I think that'd be a good idea. Go get a nurse. There were lots of ladies who had had their babies taken away who still had the ability to care for a baby. But she got her own mom, Jochebed, to come and nurse that little baby and wean that baby. No doubt taught that baby a lot of things. And we see a parental decision. I'm going to give you just a couple thoughts. Moms and dads, there's probably nothing as serious as God's given us to raise our children for the Lord. It's challenging. We do have the world. We do have the flesh. We do have the devil. But several things I see that Amran and Jochebed did. And I just remember, first of all, they, they had perception. They, they, they saw something special in Moses. And by the way, there's something special in every child. The Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go. Every child is uniquely gifted. Some children are more artistic. Some are more athletic. Some are more musical. Someone, some of them couldn't carry a, a tune in a bucket with a handle on it. Some of them, they're, they're, they just walk in a room and they know how to organize things. Others of them, uh, they, they need someone to organize and they'll just work and work with it. Some are quiet and they're really not very, uh, you could almost miss, you just, they, they just kind of so easy to be with. And others of them, they demand all of your attention. Every child is different, unique, and God has put them together. But they saw in Moses, he was very special. They had some perception. Let me just tell you something, moms and dads, all of us need to be perceptive and make discretionary decisions about our children. We just see the specialness in them and love them and help them and pray for God to give us wisdom. If any man lack wisdom, let him. One of the things I've seen in raising children, and we're not done with it, and I'm scared to death, and it's not over. But boy, we just need a lot of wisdom. I've made my share of mistakes. I've hurt my kids. I've, I've, I've no doubt stifled some of the things that God wanted to put in them. And because of my, oftentimes, I don't know about maliciousness, but just ignorance. I've not been as perceptive as I need to be. I see the perception of Jochebed and Amran. I also see something else. I see that their protection. She made an ark for him. And she protected him as best she could from what was known to be Pharaoh's orders. And Pharaoh is a type of Satan. Egypt in this story is a type of the world. And two of the enemies of the Christian is the world and Satan and ourself. But she tried to protect him. By the way, I, I love and I appreciate Christian education. I'm very thankful for that. I'm thankful that when I, I drove by this week by my first elementary school, Eastside School in Picayune, Mississippi, was the first school I ever went into. My dad was just insistent. I wanted to walk to school. He wouldn't let me walk. He was insistent he would walk me right there. He knew my teacher. He, he found out her name. He prayed for her. He would pray for me in the car before I would go in there. He was terrified. He didn't want me to learn the way of the world. He would ask me questions. The teacher say anything different today? Do you think you come from a monkey? He'd ask me, do you, are they telling you that, that everything involved? Don't listen to that. That's not true. God loves you as a man for life. He would sit there and work with that. And then two years later, he said, you know, he saw some things even worse in my heart and my life. And some of my attitudes had changed, my friends. And I ended up wanting to go to a, a birthday party where one of my kids and my dad said, well, that'd be good. I'll let you go and uh, let's buy him this. And he bought us a football. And he said, I also want you to give him a Bible. And boy, as a third grader, I rebelled against that. I said, Dad, no, not the Bible. Come on. He said, no, we give him a football, but we also give him a little Bible. No, Dad, that would be so embarrassing. He said, John, you're a Christian. I know, Dad, but you just don't know. He goes, oh, I know. 
And I remember him dropping me off and I went to that little birthday party. And I remember some of the things that happened. But this world has affected my little third grade heart. I didn't want to speak up about Christ like I should. And it was a problem. My dad said, that's enough is enough. And he found the Pioneer Baptist School. And he put me in the Pioneer Baptist School with no cheap tuition, no easy way for me and my five siblings. You know why? They, they love me. I'm so grateful for that opportunity. And some of you may not feel the same way, but boy, whatever you do, you better protect your children. They, per they perceive he was special, and your child's special. He's special enough, and she's special enough to be protected. Protected him. I find also that, um, that they not only protect him, but they prepared them. They prepared him. They prepared an ark, and they hid them for three months. She hid that little baby, but she, she, she prepared that baby. When that baby was 40 years old, deep inside his constitution, he knew that he was not an Egyptian. He was one of God's children. And I think he learned that by the time he was four years old. I think he learned that early on. Boy, some beautiful, the Hebrew ladies would take a little infant baby and they would say that Jehovah is God. Jehovah is God. They whisper in their little infant's ears while they're breastfeeding them, Jehovah is God. Teaching them early on that God is there. God loves them. They're important. God has a plan for your life. Purity is important. They begin teaching them things. Boy, I think every mama ought to hold their baby and say, well, that, that baby can't even talk yet. Let them hear your words. Let them hear the words of God. God loves you. Sin kills. Sin is awful. Holiness is right. Please the Lord. Make sure they know that God loves them and they can reciprocate that love. I think Amram and Jochebed, they certainly had some perception. They knew they had something special there, just like all of us do. They protected him. They prepared him. And I don't know all what happened there, but I also think that uh, they had a partner. And I think about Miriam. As mama went back, and I'm assuming she prayed and said, God, please. I've done all I can do. We've hit him for three months. He's starting to cry. I know I can't hide him anymore. I'm going to make this basket. I'm going to put him down. I'm going to let him go in your providence. But he, she recruited a partner. I just want to say parenthetically here, if you're a brother or a sister, you help your mom and dad raise those brothers and sisters. They need you. Nothing is more painful than trying to explain to children to do what's right when their older brother or their older sister's gone to hell in a handbasket. When all of a sudden they've got cattywampus with God and his authorities and, and all that stuff and trying to help that. And by the way, if you're an older child, you are very important in that. You're not the most important, they're the only important person. Everybody in the family is important to help people make it. I know there was someone who's credited by saying it takes a village to raise a child. It, it takes a mom and a dad. It takes the grace of God, but it does take some other partners in there. And here Miriam was someone who God used, an older sister, to protect that particular process. Grandparents, boy, you ought to pray. Don't fight your, your, their, your, your, your uh, sons and daughters, but partner with them. Sons and daughters, you ought to partner with your grandparents. And of your children, help them. And let's pray together that God would do something. There are some partners. A Sunday school teacher, you might want to take the responsibility clear. If you God give you a children to, to teach, hey, study your lesson. Pray. Seek the Lord's help. Hey, you and I are partners. And because it does take perception. It does take protection. It does take preparation and teaching and training and protecting and getting them into a, to a Christian education uh, uh, um, place and, and, and protecting what they hear and what they say. But I think it also takes partners. And then ultimately the providence of God to put them out and say, Lord, I don't know what else to do. I'm going to have to trust you. I'm going to work as, like it all depends on me. I'm going to pray like it all depends on you. There's so much about child rearing you're going to learn, and I'm learning, that there's so much that's out of my hands. We need the help of God. We need the work of God to help us. We need His providence and His love. We need partners and perception, preparation, protection. Well, that's what Moses had. But the Bible tells us that Pharaoh's daughter found him, and, 
and took him in. And she's the one who named him Moses because he had been taken out. He had been taken out. By the way, I, I, your, your name may not be Moses. I got Brother Moses down here. But all of us have been taken out for a purpose. Realize your purpose and ask God to help you with that. But then we find that Moses grows up. That's our reading started. Let's look at chapter 2 and verse number 11, if we can, please. The Bible says, And it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, that he went out to his brethren, and he looked on their burdens. And he spied an Egyptian, smiting a, smiting a Hebrew, one of his brethren. Verse number 12, read it with me out loud, would you please? And he looked this way, and, and when he saw that there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. And when he went out the second day, behold, two of the Hebrews strove together. Now two of his own brethren are fighting. And he says to, to him that did wrong, Wherefore smitest thou thy fellow? Hey, what are you hitting your friend for? What are you hitting your brother for? He got an unexpected answer. And he said, Well, who made thee a prince and a judge over us? Intendest thou to kill me as thou killest the Egyptian? Moses feared and said, Surely this thing is known. Several things that we see here. First of all, he gives a public decoration. He knows he's, tw he's 40. The Bible tells us in Acts chapter 7 and Hebrews chapter 11. He gives us some commentary on what was happening here. But he comes to the age of 40. That was how old Isaac was when he got married. That was when, that was when he got a bride for Isaac. And something uh, about that's kind of interesting. But nonetheless, he's 40 years old. And he knows that uh, he's not made to live as a prince in Egypt. But he gets ahead of God, I think. And he goes out and he sees an Egyptian hurting one of his, his Hebrew brethren. And he, he takes his life. But then interesting, he says he looked this way, he looked that way. He didn't see anybody. He failed to look up. <laughs> God sees everything. All things are are naked and open to the eyes of him who we have to do. Are the ways of men are before the eyes, Lord, he pondereth all his goings. Nothing gets by with God. But nonetheless, I think probably he killed that man. He didn't really do a good job burying him because everybody knew about it. Probably the guy that he delivered went off and told some people. And the next day, within 24 hours, most of his, at least these two guys that were fighting knew. And so what are you going to do? Kill me like he killed that Egyptian yesterday? And he instantly had fear in his heart. And then the Pharaoh found out about it and said, we ain't, we ain't putting up with that. And he, he had to flee. And he went out to Midian. And he goes to Midian. The Bible says he sits on the side of a well in Midian. There are several things I can see here. First of all, he, he thought he, had it, he was ready, and he wasn't ready. He was premature probably in his declaration. I don't know exactly all that that means, but I do know this. God has a way of oftentimes having people start something on their own, and he has to stop them, and later on they do that. We see Joseph. He goes out to his brothers and said, hey, found this great dream. It's unbelievable. You know, I'm a sheev. I'm a bunch of, I'm a bunch of uh, sheaves, and the other sheaves, 11 of them. Isn't that interesting? That's how each of you are my brothers. Isn't that crazy? And then the sun, the moon. Dad and mom, all of them worship me. Isn't that fun? They didn't think it was fun. Way premature. But he did that, and of course, many years later, God used him in a wonderful way, but he wasn't ready. I think of Elijah. In 1 Kings chapter 17, Elijah comes in to, to the court of Ahab and says, It's not going to rain until I say so. God's upset with you. It's not going to rain until I say so. And then he walks out and I'm sure one of the guys said, hey, you want me to kill this country bumpkin? This little guy from Tish. He said, nah, let him walk. It doesn't matter. And then it stopped raining for a while. And then he, they were looking for him. But it's interesting to me that he probably said, okay, now, Lord, I did that. Now, what else do you want me to do? He said, I want you to go sit by the little creek. And I'm, we're just going to stay there and I'll feed you. And I'm sure he twiddled his thumb and said, this is what prophets do every day? He just sat by himself and said, you know, just get meals delivered to you. Ravens bring breakfast and supper. I've got something to eat. They've got water here. But where's my next job? He didn't have a next job until he went to a, the backyard of, of uh, to Ahab's dad's house. And there was a little widow lady there. And a widow was going to take care of him. And nothing was lining up. There would be a Mount Carmel, but there was a lot of time 
between his calling and that. We see that throughout the Bible. Apostle Paul, after he got saved in Tarsus, I think he got to meet Barnabas, and they were going to go up to Jerusalem and say, okay, now look, I'm saved now, and let me help you. These are a lot of things I've learned. And they said, not so fast. You killed my daddy. I'm a widow because of you. You're not welcome here, man. I'm glad if you got saved. I don't know if it's true or not, but not welcome in the church of Jerusalem. And he had to go to three years in Arabia and other places in which God took him to the ends of the earth, but he wasn't ready when he thought he was ready. Oftentimes God does that, and I think he did it with here. But today I want to talk to you just for a few moments about personal development in the desert. There are some things that Joseph had to learn. He had been to school in Egypt. He had been to the best schools. He had had the best training. He had the best food. He had lots of good things and lots of, he had a, a plush life. But he did realize somewhere in his 40th year that he chose to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. He made a choice that, that the, the riches of Christ, and by the way, God uses the word Christ, maybe didn't know him as that name, but he, he knew that the coming Messiah, it was richer to be able to, 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 to take that than to take the pleasures of, of, um, of Egypt for a short time. But God sent him out to the back desert. I don't know where you are, but I will tell you, there are lessons in the wilderness that all of us need to learn. We'll look at your passage of Scripture again, if you would please. And you'll see in verse number 15, the last few words, And he sat down by a well. And the priests of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and filled the troughs to water to their father's flock. And the shepherds came and drove them away, chased them away, and got their water. But... Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flocks. And when they came to Reuel, their father, he said, How is it that ye are come soon today, so soon today? And they said, An Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds and drew water enough for us and watered the flock. And he said unto his daughters, And where is he? And why is it that ye have left the man? Call him that he may eat bread. Verse 21, read it with me, would you please? And Moses was Sipporah, his daughter. And of course, they had a child. I want to just share with you a couple things that come to my mind today. We'll talk about this more maybe next week. But I want you to notice here real quickly several things that Moses had to learn in seclusion by himself. And some of you, you're there. You're in a time where you feel like you're twiddling your thumbs. Something's going to happen, but you don't know when it's going to happen. You find yourself in a little bit of a zone of silence, and you're, you're trying to figure out, what am I supposed to be doing right now? This is not how I plan life to be. This is not what I want to happen. And I, I know this because I've lived there, and sometimes I live there today. Not always sure exactly all that my future will hold. But here, Moses learned a few things on the backs of that. Now, first of all, I think he learned humility. Would you hold your place there? And by the way, he went out here to this backs of the desert, and the first thing he has to do is feed some sheep. He will become a shepherd for the next 40 years. I want you to look at, uh, hold your place there, and turn to Genesis chapter 46, and look at the last words of chapter 46, would you? This is Joseph giving his family advice when they come into Goshen. Look at the last two lines. For every shepherd is a what? Unto? Where was Moses raised? Egypt. And shepherds in Egypt at the time were an abomination. He said they were just the lowlifes. Guess what job God gave him for 40 years? Doing something that he never thought he would ever do. Watch stinking sheep. Watch sheep. I think the lesson we learn whenever we don't understand what's going on in our season of life, we, learn, we need to learn the lesson of humility. It's not how I think. It's not what I want. It's not what I think ought to happen and how I feel. I need to just continue to do what God wants me to do. Humility. The Bible says that God resisteth the proud, but he gives grace unto the... You want God's grace? Humble yourself. Do things that are off your, off your rug, 
off your grid, off of your norm, off of what you want to do, like you think you should do or you feel like you should do. Maybe people say, well, I don't, want to pay. I don't want to be a part of this, or I don't want to do this. I don't know if I should go there. Listen, friends, God is working, and God chose to put um, Moses as a shepherd. A thing that as he grew up, it was so disdained, it was called an abomination. Humility is a lesson we can learn. You know, there's two ways to humble. be humble. Number one, you can humble yourself, or you can let God do it. I've tried both ways. I would prefer the beginning one. Letting God do it gets real embarrassing. It's not easy to humble yourself, but that's what God tells us to do. Even for revival with his people in 2 Chronicles, he said, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble them, them to humble themselves. Humility is a lesson we learn. I want to think another lesson we learn is faith. Faith. Just trusting God. Trusting him in the dark. Not understanding what's going on. I'm sure that, that Moses had a lot of things that he thought, man, am I, am I, should I go back in now? What should I do? He learned lessons of faith. And faith is basically trusting God enough to just do what he asks you to do. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he shares on our way while we do his good will. He abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey. There is no other way to be happy in Jesus. Listen, Mama, trust God. Lonely person, trust the Lord. You got marriage difficulties, trust God and keep working. The kids are struggling, trust the Lord. Put your faith on Him. Don't try to find your answers in, a, in some other source. Go to the God of the Bible. I thank you. He learned lessons of humility, lessons of faith. Here's another lesson I think he learned, and that was lessons of patience. He had to learn just to wait. The Bible says he was content to stay with the man. Boy, many of us, were just not content. We're itching inside. We've got to do something. We'll do something even if it's wrong. <laughs> we, we, the waiting process. So you saying this morning, wait on the Lord. I don't like it. You don't like it. I remember when I came here and we found out that we had $16.5 million worth of debt. I thought to myself, oh man, the Lord is going to do something big. I can't wait. I'm still waiting. <laughs> this summer it will be down to 10-3, I think, and I'm thankful for God's goodness. But I was, I was hoping for lap band surgery. And God wanted to exercise discipline and faith. I was hoping for a quick fix. You know what God is teaching me in this process and teaching us? To trust Him. To be patient. Amen. To know He's a God of process. He's working through things. He loves us. And to be patient with Him. These are lessons in the backside of the desert. Lessons of humility. Lessons of faith. Lessons of patience. I think another lesson that comes to my mind is contentment. The Bible tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 6, you're familiar with it, godliness with contentment is great gain. Contentment is understanding that God has given me everything I need right now to be happy. So if I'm not happy right now, it's not God's fault. I may not have it the best I like it, but whatever I've got, God's given me. God's given me everything I need. I remember hearing Brother Hiles say years ago, want what you have, not what you don't have. Put your hand around the steering wheel of your car and say, Lord, thank you for this car. Whatever key you put in today to go into a studio apartment or a mansion, say, Lord, thank you for this place that you've given me to live. Thank you for this. Be content. I think he learned some lessons in his roles as a family. God gave him a wife, Sephora. Gave him children. One of them is named here, Gershom. A land given to him while he was a stranger. He learned lessons of family. You know, this is where God teaches us so many things about our life, is, is in the home. And the Bible tells us the, 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 in, in 1 Timothy, he said, I want you to teach your, treat your older man at the church like your dad. Well, if you're not a good son to your dad, you're probably going to struggle with the older men in your church. The younger women, like your sisters, with all, if you're not a good sibling, you'll probably struggle with others too. It's that incubator in which God helps us to learn uh, relationships in this life. I think Moses learned some things about family, about being a husband, 
about being a father. And I tell you, if you heard a man say, if you work on your marriage, I think Brother Mike Ray said this, if you're working on your marriage, your marriage will work. If you stop working on your marriage, it's going to stop working. Reminding us that it has to take work to be a good family person. We just want to say, well, I'm a wife now, so everything should be fuzzy wuzzy. It's not that way. Well, we got kids now, so it's going to be great. No, it's going to be work. It's going to be learning, a learning curve. That God's going to help us. I find another thing that he learned is learned shepherding. He learned to take care of sheep. We find this in the book of Psalm 78, and the 72 through 70, 70 to 72, the last three verses of Psalm 78. The Bible says, and I chose David from the sheepfolds, who was following around ewes, expecting children, expecting new lambs, being great with child. I, I don't know all that means, but it sounds like a lot of work to me. Sounds like they don't have their babies all at the same time. 10 o'clock, let's pop them out. Let's go. Here we go. No, I'm sure it's nighttime, daytime, cold, rainy, whatever. Whenever it comes time, they follow them around until they have their babies. Learning to be flexible, learning to be adjusting, and then learning to be a stranger. Learning a new language, a new way of life. Forty years in Egypt, now he's learning to operate as a stranger. By the way, God, you first to us in First Peter, that you're strangers, you're sojourners in this land. Learning how to live in a world that hates God. A world that needs Him, but they don't want Him. They don't even know what they need. As I had a chance to, today to see some children ride a, a bus, I think, you know, and they're coming out of different homes. And I'm seeing people that are driving by or walking or watering their plants on a Sunday morning, or waving at them. They're just like, who are you? No one looks happy. They, haven't, they don't have a reason to be happy. What they need is the Lord Jesus Christ, but they don't have him yet. Learning to interact in a foreign land when things are not comfortable for us, but they're good for God and God's glory. There are some things we need to learn in the wilderness. Are you a good student? Am I a good student? Am I learning to be patient? Am I learning to be faith-filled? Am I learning to be a shepherd? Am I learning to be humble? Not have to have it my way or see it my way. Boy, Moses got turned on, on his head. But God had something very special for him. You'll see in chapter 3, he sees a burning bush. Things begin to light up. He gets to see the, the Lord Jesus. At least in that burning bush, an angel of the Lord speaks to him. He gets more direction. But it's 40 long years. Most of us won't have to wait 40 years but God gave us an extreme example in Moses to learn some lessons of humility and contentment, patience, shepherding, family responsibilities, and learning to live as a stranger in difficult seasons of our life.